This seminar is for educational purposes only. It is not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Consult with your medical provider for medical advice or treatment. Although the presenters try to keep the information in this seminar as accurate and timely as possible, the speakers and Mather Hospital assume no duty to ensure the seminar is error-free. The speakers and Mather Hospital are not responsible or liable for any claim, loss, or damage resulting from you viewing this seminar. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for a Healthy You webinar series. Today's topic is, could you be walking around with a blood clot in your leg? At any time during the presentation, please feel free to enter any questions you may have using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will answer as many questions as we can within the time allotted once the presentation concludes. Your questions will remain anonymous. Today's presenter is Dr. Michael Diane. Dr. Diane earned his medical degree from the Accelerated BA MD program at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine in Cleveland, Ohio. He completed an internship in general surgery and residency in diagnostic radiology at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in New Jersey. He then completed his fellowship in vascular and interventional radiology at New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Medical College and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City before joining the staff at Mather Hospital. Dr. Diane also holds an MBA in technology commercialization with interest in healthcare operations and analytics. His clinical expertise includes all aspects of diagnostic radiology, interventional radiology, and interventional oncology. Dr. Diane is a core faculty member in the subdivision of interventional radiology and an assistant clinical professor in radiology at the Zucker School of Medicine. Dr. Diane? Good afternoon, everyone. So today we're gonna to go over the overview and management of uh, lower extremity deep venous thrombosis or DVT. I'm happy to uh, speak with everyone today regarding uh, this issue which uh, afflicts around a quarter million people a year and uh, uh, an overall prevalence of millions throughout the United States. Next slide. So what is deep venous thrombosis? Deep venous thrombosis is a formation of blood clot in one of the deep veins of the body. Today, I'm going to be focusing primarily on the uh, lower extremities of the body, the legs. Um, the uh, DVT can form in your thigh or lower leg, uh, but as I just referenced, can be anywhere in the upper extremities as well. Uh, you can see the schematic over here uh, showing uh, the uh, inside of a typical vein. Uh, those um, curves within are actually the, the valves of the veins, which we all have, particularly in the lower extremities. And you can see the blood clot forming there. Uh, some terminology to establish, uh, the technical term for a blood clot is called thrombus. And if a blood clot uh, breaks off and begins to travel or travels, that is called an embolus. So, and you can see that on the right uh, with the arrow. Next slide, please. So a uh, little bit of the uh, epidemiology. Uh, annually in the United States, approximately uh, anywhere between 150,000 and 250,000 people develop uh, venous thrombosis. Uh, there hasn't really been a consistent uh, understanding of whether or not there's a sex bias between males and females in terms of uh, DVT. However, uh, the associations of uh, forming blood clots uh, or something that uh, predisposes people to uh, form blood clots are malignancy, uh, congestive heart failure, uh, obstructive airway disease, and uh, individuals that have recently undergone surgery. I will uh, delve a bit more into this uh, in a few slides. Uh, it, it's rare amongst uh, pediatrics and adolescents. Uh, however, uh, the incidence goes to about two to three per year, uh, two to three people out of 10,000. Uh, in the age group of uh, between 30 and 49 years, uh, five per 10,000 in 50 to 59 year age group, uh, 10 per 10,000 in uh, 60 to 69 years, and 20 to 10, per 10,000 in 70, 79 years. 
so as you can see the uh it's a uh a significant increase as as time goes on uh the importance uh to note here is that about one to two per ten thousand actually have a combined deep venous thrombosis or a blood clot in the legs and a pulmonary embolism, which is the blood, a blood clot in the legs that has migrated its way to the lungs. Um, I hope to give another Healthy You seminar either sometime this summer or in the fall regarding uh, management of what would happen when the blood clots uh, make their way to the lungs and how to manage that. Um, uh, but for, the, for this talk, this will be primarily focused on the lower extremity, deep venous thrombosis. Next slide, please. So some of the signs and symptoms to look out for uh, when one uh, suspects, uh, when would one would suspect a blood clot, uh, swelling in the foot, ankle, or leg, typically on one side, that is the most sensitive sign of all is uh, lower extremity swelling, particularly on one side. Uh, cramping pain in the leg. Um, most typically people um, subjectively say it begins in the calf. Uh, an area of skin that may feel warmer than the surrounding areas. The skin can also turn pale. It can also turn reddish or bluish in color, most commonly reddish, uh, and that's obviously dependent on skin tone. Uh, and uh, as referenced above, the pain is typically in the calf, but that could also be tender to compression of the calf. So if you were to compress your calf, uh, an, a DVT might uh, bring about some tenderness there. Next slide, please. So going really uh, further into the causes of what uh, brings about a blood clot, um, and I'll, I'll try to give more of a, a 20,000 foot view and we'll delve into some of the uh, minutia as well. But something that uh, physicians uh, recognizes Virchow's triad. And those really, each uh, corner of the triangle deals with one of the main causes. The one at the apex of the triangle or at the 12 o'clock position uh, is hypercoagulability of blood. So things that cause blood to become thicker or um, begin to clump together. That includes cancer, that includes inherent diseases of the red blood cells, which may cause them to clump or general inflammatory conditions. Uh, that, that can uh, also include autoimmune disease, which I'll talk about later on as well. Uh, the second uh, point of the triangle uh, over to the right is stasis of blood. Uh, so primarily that is a sedentary lifestyle um, uh, where the blood just doesn't flow the way it should. Um, it's oftentimes experts say that one of the highest probability besides trauma um, in terms of blood clot formation is actually the reduced flow. So having flow within your veins is one of the greatest preventers of blood clots to form. Uh, that can also uh, involve varicose veins. Varicose veins are enlarged, varicose veins are tortuous, and that uh, markedly reduces the flow that one would expect within that and predispose people to uh, develop blood clots. Uh, the third corner of the triangle is vessel wall injury. Most commonly we see that in after surgery or trauma, uh, but that can also involve chemical irritation or inflammation as well. Uh, over to the right, we have a, a chart of uh, some of the risk factors, uh, age above 60, uh, but as you saw in the previous slide, uh, really anything above the age of 20, there are you, you can begin to see risk factors, but the, the highest of which uh, is in the cadre of individuals above the age of 60. Uh, sedentary lifestyle. Uh, we have seen, unfortunately, uh, a resurgence of uh, DVTs uh, in people of all ages, uh, in the, uh, of people that work uh, because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and um, the uh, large adaptation of work from home model where people are mainly sitting and, and aren't in an office setting that allows them to be more dynamic or, or even commute. Uh, injury or surgery. Pregnancy is certainly a predisposing uh, uh, situation. Birth control pills, either oral contraceptives or uh, injectables, hormone replacement therapy, uh, obesity, smoking, cancer, 
uh, heart failure, congestive heart disease, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, uh, autoimmune diseases, uh, personal or family history of DBT or pulmonary embolus, and uh, genetic predisposition as well. And that was touched upon earlier um, with uh, thrombophilias. Um, and th those are various inherent um, structural disorders of the red blood cells. Next, uh, next slide, please. A brief uh, anatomy of the uh, lower extremity veins and how they communicate uh, with others. Uh, essentially, um, a uh, broad way to think about it is that uh, the deep veins are exits uh, off of a very robust highway throughout the body, which is demonstrated on the full body schematic on the right. Um, you can see in the uh, schematic on the left, which is just an isolated leg, there are uh, three main veins in the uh, calf of the leg, the fibular vein, the anterior tibial vein, and the posterior tibial vein. As you go up into the knee, that is the popliteal vein. And as you travel further uh, towards the head, you have the femoral vein and the deep vein of the thigh. And those ultimately converge to the external iliac vein and uh, drain into the uh, remainder of the body. Over to the right, you can see those same veins in the leg, on this individual's leg. And then higher up, you can see that uh, those veins ultimately coalesce into something known as the inferior vena cava, which is the one that kind of runs um, vertically uh, midline uh, through this individual's body and uh, into the heart. Uh, the veins drain blood from the extremities and bring them back to the heart. They are carrying back deoxygenated blood from your legs or from your arms back to the heart. And the arteries are pushing blood towards the extremities and carrying nutrient-rich, oxygen-rich blood to the extremities, which need the um, oxygen and nutrients for metabolism. Um, so ultimately, when I talk about the uh, pulmonary emboli or the blood clots that travel to the lungs, you can see how that works here in the sense that if a clot dislodges from one of the legs, it makes its way through that circuit and straight to the heart through the inferior vena cava there. Next slide, please. This, uh, this slide is, uh, a, I think, a nice um, diagram of the evolution of blood clot. I think one of the most salient points in this talk is uh, to understand that not all clots are the same. And as clot begins to mature, it's maybe not uh, the best way to think about uh, in terms of, well, we, we still call it a blood clot, but functionally it no longer is. So on this, uh, on the left side of diagram, uh, you will see uh, on the rightward row, the one in the middle, uh, you will see the darkest of the clots, and that is a fresh blood clot that is rich with red blood cells uh, that came from, uh, I believe it came from a, 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 a vein, uh, a carotid artery, I'm sorry. And uh, you can see that it is soft and mushy in terms of its composition. And over further to the right, you can see that diagram of the inside of blood vessels. And it shows uh, there's one for acute and one for chronic. Um, and uh, you can see that the acute one has a bunch of different uh, components to it involving RBCs, that's over to the side there, platelets, and monocytes, which are a type of uh, white blood cell. Those form the matrix of an acute clot or something that formed very recently. And that corresponds to, this, to the darkest of the clots that you can see on the, on the leftward diagram there. That's soft, that's mushy, that's a fresh clot. Um, D-dimer, which is something that you can see uh, over there as a component, is a breakdown product of clots. And that's something that I'll talk about later. It's a lab test or a blood test that uh, can be ordered to determine the probability of somebody having a blood clot. More importantly to note, as blood clots become chronic, the better way to think about them instead of thinking of them as clot is, is of scar tissue. 
you can see that there's different components to the evolution of clot involving fibroblasts and fibrin. Those are key components in collagen deposition. And, and that's really the beginning of what you think of the scar tissue. And you can actually see under the chronic diagram over there, it looks like a trabeculated matrix of scar tissue. And that's really what happens inside of the veins after blood clot typically evolves after a month of being there. It's no longer a clot as you think about it, but rather as scar tissue that, that uh, basically fibrosis over the, uh, the lumen of the vein that used to be there. And that corresponds um, pathologically to some of the more yellowish clots that you can see. For instance, the one to the top left is the fibrin and plasma protein dominant clot. That's kind of what clot evolves into uh, after uh, about a month. Next slide, please. So some of the assessment of uh, deep venous thrombosis and how we are able to risk stratify our patients when they first arrive, one of those things is a physical exam with which some of the uh, components that I discussed earlier, the leg swelling, the increase of, of circumference in the calf or the thigh, redness of the lower extremity, pain. Um, so uh, if uh, one presents to the emergency room or an urgent care clinic or their primary care doctor, many times we uh, calculate something called a well score. And uh, that uh, there are well scores for DBT and there's well scores for pulmonary emboli, the blood clots to the to the lungs as well. And uh, this one is for DVT of the lower extremities. And you can see uh, what um, comes into it. And uh, that is uh, active cancer, it's immobilization, uh, individuals that are uh, bedridden uh, for more than three days or under, underwent major surgery, uh, individuals that uh, have an entire swollen leg, uh, calf swelling, uh, greater than three centimeters, more than the other one, uh, something called pitting edema, which is when you push down and uh, that in imprintation in your leg stays for a few seconds or longer. Um, and uh, super, superficial veins that become more apparent or a history of previous DVT. Uh, so all of those things kind of get scored and you have a low, moderate or high risk of a DVT. Uh, the D-dimer, Next is a blood test that I alluded to earlier. Uh, D-dimer is a breakdown product of clot, and that's something that can be detected within the blood. Uh, and that's something that allows the doctors, either an emergency medicine doctor or a primary care doctor, uh, someone that you'd see in urgent care, to determine the probability of having a blood clot. Uh, oftentimes that is uh, complemented with a lower extremity ultrasound, uh, which I'll, I'll show you folks in a moment. Uh, but the ultrasound is, is essentially a proof of the fact that the blood clot exists and uh, the extent of the blood clot and actually allows us to um, um, determine the chronicity of the blood clot or how long that clot has potentially been there. Uh, that in addition to the history. Optional uh, is something called a CT venogram. Uh, it is not commonly performed but rather somebody that has extensive blood clot on the ultrasound uh, may, uh, the uh, assessing physician may opt for a CAT scan to see how high up the blood clot extends. Uh, the lower extremity ultrasound is a lower extremity ultrasound. So that just involves the uh, thigh up to the groin and the CAT scan will really be able to see the more central veins, for instance, that inferior vena cava that we spoke about and higher to see how far exactly that blood clot extends. And that will radically alter the way we um, risk stratify and even treat that patient. Next slide, please. So here are uh, some ultrasounds of the lower extremity. I want to focus on the one that is essentially uh, outlined in black uh, in the uh, lower right-hand corner. You will see uh, labeled super superficial femoral artery and right next to it, the uh, femoral vein, which is the uh, highlighted in blue. Um, that is a normal, oh, now we're focusing on the vein, that is a normal uh, femoral vein. 
it should look black like that. And black means that there's just blood flow within it. There's nothing that is uh, really uh, thicker or anything that reflects ultrasound uh, waves uh, more than just a, a, a thicker fluid such as blood. However, look at the other images now. And you can see, for instance, uh, let's take a look at A and B. So instead of there being a uh, purely black um, uh, tube there, you can see those white arrows pointing to something within it that's a bit brighter. That's blood clot within it. And in the uh, lower left-hand corner, you can see uh, these two little stars uh, right next to one of the veins. And the ultrasound technologist is trying to compress the vein to see if there's blood clot within it. And it doesn't, it doesn't truly compress very much. And that has a very high, I mean, that's essentially compatible with a deep venous thrombosis. And you can see that in the sense that uh, there, is, there is bright uh, material within it, as opposed to being a black, um, just a, a black circle there. there are, there's bright material within it, and it does not compress. And that is essentially compatible with a DVT. Next slide, please. All right. So uh, when someone presents to an emergency room, an urgent care center, or uh, uh, their internal medicine doctor with uh, symptoms that concern them, some of the ones that we discussed earlier, the leg swelling, the pain, uh, the tenderness, um, the change in skin color, those things, uh, some of the things that uh, individuals uh, may be advised to do, uh, first of all, they'll be put on a blood thinner. That is uh, essentially uh, one of the initial treatments of uh, blood clots in the lower extremities. They may be prescribed a compression stocking for a number of weeks to months, uh, which helps uh, promote the uh, circulation of blood in the lower extremities. They may be asked to do something called calf pumps, which basically means um, uh, exercising the muscle of the calf or something like a pushing against the gas pedal motion uh, of your foot, which helps uh, uh, move the muscles of your calf. Uh, the, an individual that might be treated as an outpatient or somebody that might be sent home uh, and, and brought back for follow-up need to certainly have stable vital signs. Um, usually those individuals do not have uh, significant kidney issues and are not at high risk of bleeding. I say kidney issues because uh, those individuals actually have issues on both sides of the spectrum. They um, have uh, more of a predilection to clot and also because the kidneys play a role in the clotting cascade, they also have a higher risk of bleeding. So they have, uh, depending on their physiologic circumstances at the moment, they actually have risks for both increased clotting and increased bleeding. So that makes uh, the management a bit more complex. Uh, patients that we might want to keep within the hospital, meaning we will not discharge them from the emergency room right away, are people that have a significant bulk of clot, uh, something that we call iliofemoral, which basically means that the blood clot extends not just in the calf, but really beyond the knee and extending into the thigh or the groin, or symptoms of ischemia with something called phlegmasia. I'm going to go into that very shortly. Other individuals may be high risk for bleeding uh, on a blood thinner. Those can involve individuals that have uh, significant balance problems, somebody that may be prone to fall, somebody that uh, has issues of uh, uh, you know, uh, excess alcohol consumption, uh, so those types of patients may uh, want to uh, be kept in house uh, because they may not be qualified uh, to uh, be initiated on a blood thinner. And also individuals that have blood clots that have embolized or shot up to the lungs, uh, that may be uh, compromising their uh, heart and lung function and they may, may need to remain in the hospital to be treated. Next slide, please. So for for individuals with blood clots, one in in the legs, uh, one of the issues to worry about chronically is something called post-thrombotic syndrome. As I mentioned earlier, a blood clot initially forms at some point and is soft and mushy, 
and mainly comprised of uh, red blood cells and white blood cell types called monocytes and uh, platelets. And it's it, again, it's soft. And as time goes on, particularly beyond the one month point or four weeks, that clot begins to functionally resemble scar tissue. And in that case, patients may start developing symptoms of something called post-thrombotic syndrome. Between anywhere between a, a, ra a very radical range of 20 to 80 plus percent of patients develop post-thrombotic syndrome, sometimes despite optimally uh, thinned out with, with regard to their blood. Uh, and that could be a very tricky issue to deal with. Now, uh, I'll go into some of the symptoms of post-thrombotic syndrome in a moment, but basically the um, what causes post-thrombotic syndrome is that once the scar tissue begins to develop in the veins, the blood truly cannot flow through that vein anymore. The valves in the veins become damaged and uh, the veins be become fibrotic or scarred down and they're not able, they're not compliant anymore. They're not uh, able to uh, distend and contract like they once were. And that produces something called venous hypertension. It's a, it's a very scarred down vein that doesn't, uh, is not able to accommodate the increases and decreases of blood flow with breathing and walking and activities of daily living. How will this manifest? This can manifest with leg pain, leg swelling, uh, something called venous claudication, like a cramping uh, sensation in the lower extremities, hyperpigmentation, meaning a dark, darkening patches of the skin in the calves or thighs, varicose veins, or even ulcers, skin ulcers, secondary to stasis or secondary to the lack of blood flow. E even the blood clots in the veins of the legs can be limb-threatening uh, in something called phlegmasia cerulea dolens. And uh, to, to keep it simple, uh, basically, as uh, mentioned earlier, the arteries of the body uh, push blood out to the extremities, the arms, the legs, because they carry oxygenated blood for, the ce for cellular metabolism. And the veins carry that back to the heart to, to be recharged with oxygen again. If there are uh, blood clots that cannot be traversed in the veins, meaning the vein is completely clogged, with scar tissue or clot that backs up actually into the arterial system and may really even compromise that limb. Next slide, please. When we receive patients uh, more that, that, for instance, many of whom have had identified blood clots in the past, but have persistent symptoms, so they've already been diagnosed with a blood uh, clot in the legs, and were put on a blood thinner and they were sent home, but they still have progressive symptoms. Uh, we do something called a Velalta score, which uh, Velalta named after someone. Um, there are, those involve symptoms uh, such as pain, cramps, heaviness, itching, or even numbness slash tingling. And that's something that the patient self reports to us. And then other six signs are things that I as a physician will evaluate. Is there swelling? Um, is there um, uh, something called skin induration, which is kind of thickening of the skin from inflammation or, or fluid buildup? Uh, is there darkening of the skin or dark patches? Uh, are the vein, you know, superficial veins more prominent? Is there redness? Is, is, does the patient have pain when I compress their cap? So those are some of the things that go into my evaluation of the patient um, uh, after they've had a, a, what is known as a chronic blood clot, typically over four weeks and I give them a score. And these scores, uh, as you can see below on the scale, the uh, PTS is post-thrombotic syndrome. So it's no, none, mild, moderate, or severe. And that uh, essentially is a predictor of how that will essentially affect the quality of your life. Um, these things, uh, these symptoms and these signs unintervened can progress and can really uh, affect the activities of daily living, can cosmetically affect the patient, uh, and certainly their overall functionality and sense of well-being because of this chronic uh, heaviness, chronic skin changes, pain, swelling, uh, and decreased range of motion. So these can be very, very debilitating issues. And it, it 
so often we see that even an individual that's put on an optimal blood thinning regimen still winds up experiencing these issues of post-thrombotic syndrome. And that's uh, really where, uh, that's really my uh, area of expertise. Uh, and one of my fortes is the uh, mechanical removal of clot for uh, deep venous thrombosis of the veins, which we'll talk about in, in a quick moment. Next slide, please. Uh, once again, just another schematic to show uh, some of these signs and symptoms of acute, subacute, and chronic clot. Um, you'll see uh, the individual uh, right above the label acute DVT has somewhat of a reddened uh, and swollen uh, lower extremity. And uh, the individual in the middle, which is subacute, somewhere between two and four weeks, uh, this individual will start having some uh, heaviness, redness, uh, but the redness be also might start to manifest as a, a hyperpigmentation or darkening of the skin. And even some of the superficial veins, you could start seeing more clearly that were not there before. Later down the road, as it becomes chronic, you might get skin ulcers. Uh, you might get a redness that doesn't um, wax and wane given the day. Uh, and also the swelling will be uh, really irreversible and not uh, cyclical as it was prior. Next slide, please. Just one more diagram of uh, uh, pictures that I've taken myself of uh, an individual with an acute and a chronic DVT. The patient with the acute DVT or somebody that has had a DVT within a couple of weeks uh, has a leg that looks like the one on the left. So that entire leg is swollen and red in contrast to the right leg that their left leg is the affected one there. And that's how it looks. You can see the calf and even the uh, area around the knee and the foot are, are significantly swollen and, and the whole skin color is uh, markedly different in contrast to the contralateral leg on the right. Uh, looking at the other individual uh, in the rightward picture, uh, it is the right leg that is affected there with those two marks on the leg. Uh, those are just marks that we place for the, uh, for the ultrasound. Uh, and, and you can see the, the, the leg is swollen in contrast to the left leg. And also you see those, uh, those brown patches of skin color changes. And actually this individual, uh, a patient of mine, uh, you can, when, if you look closely, you'll start seeing a lot of those superficial veins um, uh, begin to uh, be much more evident manifesting right over the foot there. So if you look at those two uh, marker hatch marks and you make your way down to the foot, you could start seeing a, a couple of veins that have been dilated there. Next slide, please. So before uh, we think about intervening, um, and, and we'll go into the intervention uh, shortly, uh, we make sure that the patient is on an optimal blood thinning regimen and which will not be stopped, meaning you will continue the blood thinner uh, to the day of your procedure. Uh, Pre-surgical testing here at Mather will uh, conduct blood work and a COVID test approximately three to five days before the procedure. Uh, Pre-surgical testing or PST We'll also uh, do an exam and determine the need uh, for either cardiology or pulmonary clearance. Um, so for instance, if someone has an extensive cardiac history, um, a coronary artery bypass grafting, uh, multiple stents, um, a heart failure, or something called COPD, uh, individuals that have a significant smoking history um, or uh, perhaps even lung cancer. So things of that nature may require uh, visits to the uh, pulmonary uh, slash critical care doctors or the lung doctors uh, to just make sure that uh, you're optimized uh, for any type of procedure that might uh, be ensued. Uh, nothing to eat or drink past midnight the night before the procedure. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, we perform these procedures under uh, what we call moderate sedation. So most likely for most, for the majority of individuals that we intervene on, there is no need for general anesthesia, so there's no tube down anyone's throat. Uh, we actually just administer a combination of uh, an analgesic uh, in the same fam, or, or an anxiolytic rather, in the same family as Xanax, uh, and a pain medicine uh, to help with some discomfort during the procedure. And most individuals are relaxed and even drift off to sleep. Things that we certainly look out for 
that may complicate a procedure. So we would most likely delay a procedure to another time if somebody has an active infection in their bloodstream, if someone has pneumonia, whether bacterial pneumonia or uh, even COVID-19, uh, someone that has had a trauma that may prevent them from walking around. The reason for this is that if we do intervene to remove the blood clot, uh, we would like that individual to walk around. And if there's something preventing them from walking around, we want to make sure that they get better first before we uh, remove the blood clot so that they're able to um, stay active and uh, prevent further blood clots from uh, materializing. Next slide, please. All right, so here are a couple of procedures uh, of mine that I have performed. Um, there is, uh, so let's start with the picture on the right. The, the, the way the procedure goes is that the patient lies on their stomach uh, in our procedure room in the interventional radiology suite. And depending on where the blood clot is, we almost always access a vein behind the knee. So again, if you were to imagine the patient is lying on their stomach on the procedure table, so we're seeing the back of their legs, and we are able to access a vein in right uh, on the back of their knee or upper calf. Uh, we use an ultrasound to access with a tiny needle, so we give some numbing medicine, and we even give the medicine uh, in the IV to help relax people and to help them with pain. We give some numbing medicine in the skin in the back of the leg, and we just go in with a small needle into the vein using an ultrasound and uh, be, uh, begin advancing our wires and catheters. Ultimately, you'll see, uh, if you look at the image to the left, that is one of the uh, catheters that can be used to remove blood clots. Um, this particular one is made by a company called Inari, but uh, there are many others uh, that, that are used. Um, and that goes actually into the vein. And I will show you folks in a second what the mechanism is of how we remove the clots, but just uh, I wanted to highlight what the general setup is and how things look in our procedure room. Next slide, please. So uh, again, the patient is under something called moderate sedation. Uh, we give some local anesthesia or lidocaine at the access site, so uh, an injectable uh, local anesthesia. We, we even give a dose of blood thinner uh, with, during the procedure, uh, even if you are on a blood thinner prior, that is okay. We give you an extra dose, typically of something called heparin. And uh, that's because by us just even having our catheter within the vein, that could be a nidus uh, or a, a cause for blood clot to develop even further. So we make sure that the blood is thin to our satisfaction to make sure that uh, further blood clots do not form within, during the duration of our procedure. And um, uh, I'll talk about what we do. So essentially we uh, go in with the catheter that you saw earlier on the prior slide into the vein. We slide it up the vein through a very, very tiny uh, hole in the skin, maybe a few millimeters in diameter. And we bring up that catheter and the catheter at the, at the end of it, you can see there is a very soft um, basket of a material that is very compliant uh, called nitinol. And it's very gentle on the inner walls of the veins. And we just run that basket along and scoop out the clot. Uh, we use a combination of that basket and also a suction mechanism to actually uh, suck out the clot with negative pressure or vac essentially a small vacuum that we're able to suck it out and also mechanically uh, pull it out with this uh, basket over here that you can see. And you can see the schematic of how that catheter uh, deploys the basket. And uh, you can see that um, digital clot there. And you can see as the basket is wrapping around the clot and ultimately will pull out that clot from the individual's leg. Can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. We then run another catheter, this uh, called intravascular ultrasound or IVIS, which is the abbreviation. You can see the catheter in the upper right-hand corner. It's a very, very thin catheter that it runs inside of the vein. And we're able to actually see, we do both pre and post procedural assessments to see uh, A, what it looked like to begin with, how extensive is the clot, 
And afterwards, we see how uh, satisfactory of a job we did in terms of removal of the clot. And if we just have to go back qu quickly uh, in that same session and remove a little bit more with our catheter. On the image to the left, you can see the uh, those uh, uh, blue and yellow lines drawn there. Uh, and that is, th those are mapping the clot. The clot is that bright area within the yellow uh, circle. And you can see over to the right uh, in the green circle, it, it's essentially uh, black and it doesn't have anything bright within it. And that means that that vein has been cleared of the blood clot. And you can actually measure the diameter and the area within the vein to make sure that there's no stenosis or narrowing. So this is really an amazing technology which allows us to do um, to see from the inside of the vein. Uh, so it's not an ultrasound that somebody puts on the outside of your body, but attached to a tiny catheter running through the inside of your vein, where we're really able to see the inside out. And it's one of the most accurate means of determining um, whether or not there's narrowing and whether there's residual blood clot left, in addition to initial assessments of the bulk of blood clot and the extent of blood clot. So a very nice technology. Uh, which we which we have the most um, up to date version of here at Mather. Next slide, please. So here are some of the results. This uh, was an individual who uh, 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 worked from home and uh, uh, didn't do themselves well of, in terms of getting up much during the day, and had uh, lower extremity swelling of a of a day significantly with discoloration, similar to the individual that I showed uh, a diagram or a picture of rather. And this is the clot that we extracted. You can see it is soft. It is mushy. Uh, uh, in At one part of it, it came out in a single piece and in other parts came out in a fragmented fashion. But uh, this is how a Q clot looks. I just wanted you folks to see the consistency of it, the color of it, and frankly, the bulk of what can be taken out of someone's leg. It could be a huge amount of clot. Uh, and again, this is fresh clot. Uh, so this has not turned into scar tissue yet. And this individual did not yet have symptoms of post-thrombotic syndrome. So again, post-thrombotic syndrome is more of a chronic process that develops over weeks to months. And um, uh, that's a totally different um, uh, issue to deal with, but managed similarly. Next slide, please. Now, in an individual that has clot for weeks to months, and that vein has turned into scar tissue, we actually extract the clot in a very similar way. So the procedure is almost identical to the acute clot. So in terms of what you were to experience as a patient, even if you have chronic uh, issues of DVT, it's going to be very similar procedurally uh, with, with essentially the same devices. But you can see the characteristic differences in the blood clot that I have pictured here, where I removed uh, this clot from a patient that had, uh, had had issues for weeks to months. And you can see that it is yellow, it is remodeled. And actually, what, uh, if you look at the right-handed diagram, you'll see that there's a, a elongated string of blood clot, almost a cast of the vein and that is essentially, if, if, to think about it in a, in a more functional way, it is a scar that we're removing scar tissue at this point. Um, some of the more uh, red or purplish bits of it are still uh, red blood cell rich components, but the other ones that are more yellowish have remodeled and really are just scar tissue at this point. Next slide, please. So, what, what are you to expect after such a procedure? Essentially, uh, all we do is the wherever we access, whether we access behind one of the knees or both of the knees, you get a, uh, simply have a Band-Aid on the back of each one. So uh, no stitches, um, no significant scar, just a small access site of a few millimeters covered by a Band-Aid. Uh, we typically uh, ask for an hour of bed rest just so that uh, sedation wears off. And uh, two hours after the procedure, most patients just go straight home. Um, there's no need for uh, pain medicine really over the, uh, besides over the counter pain medicine. So uh, no need for narcotic pain medicine or anything stronger than what you're uh, able to find in, on the counters of a pharmacy. 
we do encourage ambulation or walking. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, one of the strongest preventers of blood clots forming in the legs is blood flow through the veins. So the uh, walking, doing something, doing those calf pumps or the pushing against the gas pedal motion in your calves and legs, those things uh, help move the blood along within the venous system of the lower extremities and help the prevention of blood clots. I uh, oftentimes will prescribe a compression stocking as well. We typically recommend between 20 and 30 millimeters of mercury of compression. Um, and uh, that helps again, move the, with the flow of, of blood through the venous system uh, and helps stasis or uh, stagnation of flow within that system. And uh, would, which would put the patient at risk for a repeat uh, recurrent blood clot. Uh, I like to see my patients back two weeks after the procedure for a follow-up exam at which time we also do an ultrasound to make sure that the clot that we have extracted or cleared out uh, has remained clear, no new clot has formed, um, and uh, we uh, reassess the anticoagulation or the blood thinners as well. Uh, most typically, there's uh, something called a, a direct uh, oral anticoagulant such as Eliquis or Xarelto. However, there are other options which are very valid as well, which uh, uh, essentially do the same thing through a different mechanism. Next slide, please. That's it, here's some of the references. And uh, to schedule a consultation, uh, feel free to reach out, 631-476-2767. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Diane. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your very extremely, your extremely informative presentation. I see a couple of questions. If anyone has questions, just a reminder, there's a Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen. All questions are anonymous to protect your privacy. Here's a question. How does 81 baby aspirin help? So any, any dose of aspirin uh, does, to some extent, thin out the blood. Um, however, that is not considered to be a therapeutic dose uh, to thin out the blood enough, uh, particularly if there's a pre-existing blood clot uh, that would need to be uh, modified and adjusted. But uh, traditionally speaking, that, that does decrease the risk of uh, blood clot formation if uh, a baby aspirin or an 81 milligram dose is taken. Uh, typically on a daily basis. So it is um, helpful. However, the, the um, greatest preventer of blood clot formation is, uh, as we mentioned, the flow of uh, blood within the veins, and that is best promoted with walking, with getting up frequently, uh, and um, uh, yeah, the, and staying, keeping an active lifestyle. Uh, the same patient said it felt like a person put a cigarette out in my ankle. Yeah, uh, that, that's a sensation that we often uh, are, we have described similarly. It's a burning sensation when individuals get a deep venous thrombosis in their calf, uh, and it could be extremely painful. And uh, uh, sadly enough, uh, discourage individuals from ambulating further, which uh, is a, unfortunately a, a never-ending cycle, which promotes even more clot formation. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a very delicate process. And uh, that's really where our expertise here at Mather um, can do uh, the population uh, experiencing DVTs much good in that we optimize their blood thinning regimen and uh, my own or this department's own expertise, which is the intervention or the procedural intervention for these blood clots. Is vibration good for the legs and feet? I'm sorry, say that one more time, please. Is vibration good for the legs and feet? Well, I, I, I'm not entirely sure what that means, uh, but n uh, I would say that the, uh, a ca the calf pump muscles, so the muscles that we use to walk, um, or for instance, uh, doing, pushing against the gas movement, those are the ones that really promote the flow. They help pump with pressure gradients, the flow from the leg back into the body and the heart. So it, it, it's uh, the other um, maneuvers 
uh, are really ancillary and, and uh, I'm, I'm particularly vibration, I'm not sure has ever been shown to uh, increase the or decrease the chances of developing a blood clot, but frequent walking, exercise, even compression stockings, those things really just help promote the flow by creating constant pressure differentials as the patient breathes throughout their respiratory cycle and throughout their typical gait or as they walk and put weight on their extremities and take a stride forward. If there's any further questions, please enter them. I don't see any more. Thank you, Dr. Diane, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. If you have any additional questions, please email them to Mather Hospital at northwell.edu, and we'll be sure to get those to Dr. Diane and get answers for you. Once you exit the webinar, you'll see a link to complete a brief survey. If you could please complete the survey, your feedback is extremely important to us and helps us plan our future programs. Thank you all for joining today's webinar. If you'd like to view other Healthy You webinars we've presented, you can find them at matherhospital.org slash Healthy You.